Okay, we'll go ahead and, and get started. Welcome to the uh, Manhattan City Commission work session for Tuesday, May 11th, 2021. And we'll begin with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have uh, one discussion item tonight, which is the Manhattan Developmental Code, and you can take it from there, Chad. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. I'm Chad Bunger, the Assistant Director for Community Development, and uh, continuing our little series here of uh, updating on the, the draft, the latest draft of uh, the Development Code. Um, probably what I thought I would do first, so We'll cover Article 5 tonight, which is really kind of the halfway point of this uh, fast-paced marathon series uh, to get you uh, informed about the development code. So I'm curious if you all have any comments or questions thus far, if you've heard of anything, uh, talking to uh, your friends and neighbors and whoever in the community of, um, uh, you know, how, how are we doing in drafting this so far? Anything so far? I've heard absolutely nothing. Okay, which well. Makes, which makes me wonder if we're reaching anyone. <laughs> yeah, um, we're starting to. You know, we're still in early days of this. Uh, still have a bit of time. Um, did have an ordinance advisory committee last week. Uh, fairly sparse attendance, but we, we talked to four or five consultants um, with that group. Uh, we've been to the planning board several times. Um, and moving forward, and, and we've done four posts on Engage MHK, our, our engagement site, where we're putting videos and whatnot. So we're, we're getting some traction there. I think we've had about three or 400 visitors to that site. It's separate visitors. So, um, uh, you know, I, I wish it could be millions, but that's not a horrible number for the topic, I guess. Um, and then we will start in the next couple of weeks reaching out to stake well this week we will start reaching out to stakeholders uh, the power users is what I would call them to arrange meetings and have conversations with them directly one-on-one -on -one. so the engineer society uh, the local chapter local chapter of architects the builders association the realtors association those kind of groups to get in front of them and and have some conversations with them so it's still early and we're trying, but I wanted to just touch base with you there. Um, so if no other comments, okay. Uh, I also thought we'd do a quick tutorial on EdCode Plus. Um, I watched the last um, meeting online and uh, uh, I heard some questions about how do you find certain pieces. So. Um, the, the development code was built to live online. It's certainly usable if you print it off in a hard copy and, and put it in a notebook or if you use it in a PDF. But the real power is when, it, when you view it within this site. Um, the best way to get to it, I would say right now, is to use Engage MHK. Um, see if I can get this to pop up. It is the... Um, we have a page there devoted to this, so it gets you to that page to where you can um, see all of our staff videos, which I'm pretty proud of them for doing, uh, some blog posts, those sort of things down here. But to get to the actual development code is, is on this button. Depending on what you're viewing it with a laptop or a tablet or whatever, these top tabs may change, slide around a little bit on you. But the thing to remember is to look for the view uh, tab and that gets you to um, the actual document. Some of these tabs up top here are still under development. They, we needed to wait on them until we got further down the road with drafting so that our consultant wasn't building a set of calculators and then we change everything on them and, and blow it all up. So some of these are still in the works but they will be super useful when we get there. Uh, where the power comes in with this site is um, just kind of on the fly as you're looking at things, um, usability. So Commissioner Morris, I believe you asked about definitions and why are they in, in, in Article 10. 
when you view the document online, the definitions are there in pop-ups, most of them. We, I've, I've recognized that we've had some uh, broken links and those kind of things, but we'll get those fixed. We're still in draft mode, working the kinks out. But um, as you hover over these things with underlines, then the definition pops up for you right there. Um, let's see if I can find another. And then when there's a reference to a different section, um, that one keeps us in the same section. Let me find something snazzy here. It will hyperlink you to that section. So, uh, so like this, we'll go to master development plans and just hyperlinks us over to that section where it's referenced. And you can get back by just clicking the back button in your browser. And then in, where there's links to uh, reference documents like the, the joint land use study or the comprehensive plan or whatnot, those links are also live and get you takes you out of ENCODE and over to that city website or wherever that link may live. So um, hopefully you'll find that useful. You can definitely get all the information in the hard copy, but it's much more user friendly when you're driving around it on the website. So uh, I would check that out. All right. Um, Chad, it, yes. this is uh, Aaron. Before yeah. uh, you get going too far, I Definitely. think you were kind of getting a temperature of how things are going and mm -hmm. what the feedback is. And so, like Commissioner Morse, haven't heard too much. You right. Know, that there are a few stakeholders, whatever, that have uh, been asking questions and actually uh, direct them to this website. So it's, it's helpful for them yeah. to kind of see how this process works. But um, another thing I just wanted to, I, I still have that concern or that question or that interest, however you want to frame it, around uh, the four-person rule as we might know it and uh, the way we define family, the way we maybe look at intentional communities, those type of mm -hmm. things. And I, I don't want to give you the illusion that that has been answered in a nope. way that's satisfactory <laughs> for me. Um, so just wanted to point that out and I know that uh, I've gotten some legal feedback but haven't really heard much from um, the city staff or right. or community development about that and still interested definitely and want to find a better way to modernize that mm -hmm. language um, I've done some research on it I've done some thought thinking on it I don't know if now is the best time for you or for the rest of the commission if we want to hammer this out, at least share my thoughts to it, uh, or if we want to do it at another time, I'm, I'm definitely open. So. It, it can be down the road. Okay. I, I just don't want you to. Nope, I haven't thought, forgot about it. I just haven't found that time to bring it up. Um, but I think I have some solutions, um, especially on the family definition, the topic of um, the number, if you will, of, of unrelated folks, that to me uh, is a much bigger community issue that I would like uh, some discussion on just when and how we hammer that. Um, and, and so I have some thoughts to that also. But yeah, I have definitely put some thought to it. I haven't forgot about it or ignored it or anything. I'm, I'm ready to talk about it when you are so, or when the commission is. So we can do that for sure. So. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, so on to Article 5, our subdivision regulations. If you remember, the Manhattan Development Code, formerly the Unified Development Ordinance was going to take our current zoning regulations, which is in a separate book, and combine it with our subdivision regulations, which is in a separate book, modernize the whole thing, and, uh, and then we'll have this one development document. On the face, the subdivision regulations aren't that glamorous. Um, uh, they're pretty uh, uh, bureaucratic or, or procedural oriented and, and a lot of standards and nothing real flashy there. But when you think about it, it is the uh, one of the documents that uh, make sure our, our community is served well, make sure our community is safe, and make sure that we're able to move around our community in, in a variety of modes of transportation. So it's an important document. And so we've put a lot of time and effort into this, but um, in reviewing it and modernizing it where we need to, uh, but a lot, truthfully, a lot of the standards haven't needed to change or don't change. So um, 
but I'm going to highlight uh, the big ticket items, if you will, or the big changes. The first thing to remember um, is our subdivision regulations. We share them with Riley County, kind of. Uh, our subdivision regulations apply within the city of limits. And then in 1976, we signed the, uh, mem or the uh, uh, agreement with Riley County that we would form the Urban Area Planning Board and that within this planning board boundary, they would also adopt our subdivision regulations. And the purpose of that is uh, for development that occurs on the fringe of the city, that those uh, streets and sewer and water and, inf and, and other pieces of infrastructure would be um, nearly identical to what we would uh, construct, or at least the easement wise. Easements would be there so that when eventually, uh, assuming it would eventually become part of the city of Manhattan proper, then uh, that transition would be fairly seamless. And, um, and we would, um, wouldn't have a lot of odd septic systems and small roads or large roads or, or those kind of things. So that is the point of that. I believe uh, at our next city county uh, joint meeting, we'll just have an overview of that and uh, press upon everybody the need to uh, both of us adopt these subdivision regulations uh, to keep that agreement healthy and uh, keep proper uh, development occurring around Manhattan. If not, it kind of blows the whole, whole system out of the water. So that's kind of uh, in 5A there. Really the meats and potatoes is, is in uh, the first article, but it does reference it there, and it's a good segue. Moving on, um, the subdivision type. Again, this is a new thing for us where you could have a cluster development. Um, and if you remember, a cluster develop development is something that a developer can seek where they will agree to set aside environmentally or, or environmental safe uh, special areas or areas that are important to the community and return, we would give them the ability to develop more dense, more lots, closer setbacks. Uh, they can uh, recoup some of that um, land that they would normally lose if they were to bulldoze over those trees or fill in wetlands or whatever they would get equal or more uh, buildable lots out of it and uh, more efficient use of infrastructure. Um, and so hopefully everybody wins. So in 5B2, it outlines this cluster development process. Uh, and so that's the six steps you see here. And so I picked this random piece of land, one county over to the west. So this is nowhere near Manhattan. I'm not developing anybody's land in Manhattan, anything like that. This is some random uh, piece of land way out in the middle of the county to the west of us. So uh, we won't ever look at this property. But pretending I'm, I'm the developer of this tract outlined in yellow, following this cluster development, because it looks like I could, I could benefit from it, the first thing myself or my consultant would do is do a site fingerprint. So we would look at steep slopes and identify them on a map. Uh, dense wooded areas, drainage ways and waterways, wetlands or those sort of environmentally sensitive areas. Floodplains also on that list, but we don't have a floodplain here. And then it asked me to go back and create a buffer around those drainage areas and wetlands to make sure that we stay away from the slopes and don't cause erosion and those sort of things. And so that is the site footprint of all the environmentally sensitive areas. And that would outline uh, to the developer, this is the area that I should be looking at to preserve as open space in one way or another. Then from there, we locate our building sites. I'm not a really good developer, so uh, <laughs> you're gonna have to bear with me here, but we put on our houses and then we thread our roads through there, ensuring uh, that they're, um, you know, sensitive to that, to those, um, or, you know, that they protect those environmental areas that we want to preserve. And then we would create the lot, excuse me. Um, the remaining space would then be uh, preserved as open space in one form or another, either through conservation easements, 
parsed out as separate tracks and donated to the city for a parkland maybe or trail system, kept as HOA public space, uh, donated to the Audubon or whoever, you know, whatever entity that's big in the conservation. And so that area would remain as um, dedicated open space. And then you would go through the planning process as normal and highlighting uh, design standards that are outlined in 5B2. Um, and I can pull those up if you'd like. But that's, that's that process. Um, again, it's something new. We hope people will appreciate it, but uh, we'll see. Moving on to the transportation system. Um, this is a, one that Public Works and our Community Development Department has worked a long time. For whatever reason, when you try doing math like this, it takes engineers and planners several attempts to add up uh, the width of right-of-ways and whatnot, but we got it done. Uh, so you can see kind of the aerial of what a typical street section would look like, and it attributes to, um, oops, excuse me, to this table, the cross section. The big thing here, uh, when we looked at everything that the community has done with, um, you know, the, the fifty to hundred thousand dollars every year in capital improvement projects for sidewalk infill projects across the community, safe route to schools, uh, our bicycle and pedestrian systems plan, um, the sales tax for the trail system that that passed. Um, a couple of years ago, we recognized that there was um, community want and need to make sure we have walkable neighborhoods. And so with that, we um, have proposed that sidewalks, a five foot sidewalk would occur on all, both sides of all local streets. Um, that is a new standard. Today, it's all, only on one side. Um, but because of, I think, that long track record of us trying to correct maybe some, some holes where we didn't get sidewalks where we wish we would have, and uh, I provided to you a fact sheet from AARP about the walkability and its values, um, we plugged that in as a, as a uh, proposed standard. In the arterial and collector, nothing really has changed. We've, uh, we've always required sidewalks on both sides of those streets. Um, we did shift it a little bit to where on an arterial, think Kimball, think Anderson Avenue in terms of speed and traffic, um, we, would, we would have one uh, multi-use path on one side and a six foot sidewalk on the other. So, as well as uh, accommodating for bike lanes, which generally we do, uh, but we've really spelled it out here on um, arterial and collectors local and frontage roads uh, would not need that. Um, and then in the, the pedestrian uh, section following that, it really gives some standards of just connectivity, connecting to trailheads, connecting to parks. This I think is kind of a, an interesting example. This is not in Manhattan. I don't even know where this is from, but if, if I were to not trespass on uh, anybody else's property, you know, I, have, I could have a very circuitous route to get to this wonderful park. Um, and so we're trying to put in some standards about mid-block connectivity and uh, connection to trailheads and those kind of things to make that life a little simpler for people to walk and bike to our amenities across the community. Um, this one, so I'm moving fairly fast, but like I said, not a lot has changed. These are the big ticket items. To me, in regards to a developer, uh, looking back at our development history, zoning history, since I've been around for sure, this one change could speed up uh, a lot of development processes and save a lot of time and resources. Right now, if I want to do a travel easement in my development for an apartment building or commercial development or whatever, I automatically have to put it into a plan new development. We've maneuvered around that uh, here recently, but by and large, if you want to put a travel easement on your development, you're required to go per the subdivision regulations and get a, a planned unit development zone, which means two trips to the planning board, two trips to you, 
site plan, building plan, landscape plan, lighting plan, signage plan, uh, a landscape performance agreement. It's a long, drawn out, expensive process. Where, if you look at a lot of our uh, PUDs, um, you really couldn't tell what is a PUD versus what is straight zoning that's right across the street, um, other than that it has uh, a PL for place on its street sign that threads through its development. So we've changed that to where we'll now allow travel easements in the HR high density residential district, the, the straight zoning, all non-residential districts, um, mixed use zoning district, and then uh, where needed uh, the planned unit floating district, which is the equivalent to a PUD. So we're relaxing that rule way back. We were we were not getting the products out of our PUDs that we should have. We were requiring it too many times, in my opinion. And a lot of times, it was for this sole reason here, for cross access. So there are other reasons why we've done PUDs, and they've been really good. You know, it was a unique use, or we had some other um, public infrastructure things that we wanted to tie to that PUD. But um, this, I think, is a healthy move for us to make this um, development process flow better. And then access management, we've have, we've used a lot of images here. Uh, a lot of this directly relates to the, the Manhattan Area Transportation uh, Strategy document that was adopted in 2015. Really our current subdivision regulations at times uh, differed or, or contradicted the mats and so We've cleaned that up. Hopefully these images about reverse frontages and when they're appropriate, what they are. Um, you know, residential loop streets and cul-de-sacs, eyebrow cul-de-sacs are still not cool because of the safety concerns. Uh, allowing for cross access easements and there's appropriate spacing there. Corner distance calculator or measurements, uh, cross street measurements. So. We've tried to thread in a lot of more images to make this stuff make more sense, and it ties directly to mats, and we've cleaned up all those uh, inconsistencies. So that's a big thing for us. Uh, I think this is the, my last section here. Uh, standards for public improvements. Again, not a bunch has changed. We're still gonna put sewer and water in the ground. We're still gonna make streets, uh, have uh, storm drains and those kind of things. But what we have done is defined when we will require impact studies for traffic, drainage, and then utilities. And um, a lot of those refer back to Public Works' uh, standards and specifications on some things, but at least it puts it in the development code that says, thou shall do these when you do these kind of developments to make sure that um, our street systems are, are adequate and safe. Our utilities are gonna be appropriate and adequate for, for the use and for the community around it. And that our drainage um, systems will, act, will be appropriate so we don't uh, adversely impact anybody up or downstream, so. Uh, oh, one last thing, and this is another big one, uh, sorry. Um, this is gonna be a pretty big one for some folks in that we will, um, make the definitive de statement that permanent encroachments in any easements will be prohibited. I think this, this picture, again, found it on the internet, so not Manhattan specific, but I think it outlines pretty well um, when we have utility failures or need maintenance for a utility line and there are fences in the way uh, or, or, or all sorts of other things in the way of our utility easements it becomes a costly and cumbersome process for both the city and those homeowners and business owners. So um, I know it's going to probably impact a lot of folks, but it was a recommendation from Public Works that, uh, that we put that line in the sand so we can clean that up or address that. We won't, I would, Rob can maybe correct me, but I would imagine we won't go neighborhood by neighborhood and remove fences out of ut utility easements and whatnot. What's there, I guess, will be there for the most part until we have to address it. And then we'll address it and get those fences in the appropriate locations outside of those easements. So unless Rob tells me differently, I can't imagine that will go 
will clear cut fences across the city out of easements. So, and that I think is all I have. So happy to answer any questions you may have um, and uh, uh, look forward to the conversation. <coughs> Chad, I got a question yep. um, re regarding the bicycle lanes. Uh -huh. uh, um, does that language that was in our packet regard uh, with the 10 foot arter, uh, I'm trying to look right here. Well, it says in accordance with adopted transportation system plans. So that that includes our bike ped system plan. Yes. Um, but bike lanes are required along new arterial and collector streets unless there's a minimum of 10 foot wide multi-use path on at least one side of the street. Right. Um, does that impact anything that is current? Uh, would that change any? Thing that's out there currently? Um, my guess is no, unless we go back and redesign it and retrofit it um, accordingly. You know, I think we've always had that opportunity, but this this table and this graphic and, and the standards are by and large um, for those new developments when they come online and anything that's in town, we will have to work um, to retrofit those. I know. Uh, my staff, John Adam and Ben Schmiel, who work in Pilot Trip, who work with the Bike Head Committee, do a great job coordinating with Brian and his crews to just figure out, all right, this road's going to be resurfaced. Can we restripe it for what the bicycle pedestrian plan shows it to be and, and those sort of things. So, yeah, this will be just for new, new things coming online, but always have that opportunity to retrofit something. Doesn't it apply to redevelopment also? Yeah, it would, but it'll be a little bit more difficult. You know, if you think of, um, oh, well, I think Bluemont's an exceptional example between North Manhattan and, say, 11th Street, right? We've had some really good redevelopment along that block. Um, but it wouldn't do, except for, like, the sidewalks. I would agree the sidewalks we should incorporate, but, like, the bicycle connectivity and um, lane widths if they need to occur, those kind of things. Those should be done comprehensively instead of we have a two, two block swath of a bike lane that doesn't go in either direction any, anywhere else. So, but the sidewalks most definitely will, will make that happen. This is Commissioner Reddy. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think the idea of the sidewalks on both sides is really good and uh, very timely. I read the ARP packet that you put in for us. And it, it does speak to very much, if you have a sidewalk right there, the uh, tendency to go for more walks, bike ride, whatever it might be, your physical activity increases by the mere presence of a sidewalk in there. I, I would assume that also has an impact on their property value, who pays for that sidewalk. And oftentimes, that's why a house is on one side maybe of less value if they don't have a sidewalk as to the one. So that's probably going to be uh, in discussions as people build houses or developers build houses right. that'll add an extra cost to them. Uh, the travel easements and the concerns about environmental resources around the area I thought was really well explained and well done. The encroachment piece, I, I completely agree. I think that's something that we need to do. Um, at least uh, think about when people are putting their fences and if they have to remove and all of those things. So I thought that was really good information. On the Board of Zoning Appeals, I saw their agenda today, and they were talking about windows, uh, something on windows, uh, why they were going to the planning, uh, the zoning appeals. Is that something that this would address? Uh, what we would, what I would like to see, and I think we had discussions in the past, is that the reduction of going to the Boarding of Zoning Appeals mm -hmm. anytime they want something modified and we may or may not have agreed to it at the city commission or it's different than the codes that were presented. Mm -hmm. So we want to decrease those types of agenda items. Right. Would that fall into any of these? Um, no, the, the Board of Zoning Appeals generally doesn't. I'm sorry, I wasn't being rude. I was trying to pull up that agenda item it to figure out what in the today. world no. that was. So I apologize for that. But uh, I got a feeling it was either in the multifamily redevelopment overlay district or TNO. 
Um, but where I was saying was, um, by and large, the Board of Zoning Appeals does not get involved into subdivision issues. So they probably won't get here all that much um, in terms of what they're approving or not approving, you know, the, the, the requests. Although the, some of these things like the sidewalks, um, we may make as a condition if, if uh, an area is redeveloping and they need a conditional use. Mm -hmm. So, to, you know, let's say for a, a uh, drive, drive through restaurant and there's not a sidewalk on that street, we will probably point to this and say, you really should have one. Uh, for the betterment of the community, um, but by and large, the Board of Zoning Appeals won't won't live in this section or in this article. Yeah, and you know we're just reading this section by section, yep. so of course this probably wouldn't fall into the section we're speaking about tonight. Right. But just for future reference, mm -hmm. one of the reasons we talked about is no matter what we agree to today, if they say I would like a fence here. Right. Right. Uh, oh, that part, yes. Um, no, that, that won't, they won't have any ability to, uh, sorry, I totally misunderstood your question. Yeah, I, I don't mean so to sorry. to the windows. Uh, they definitely will not have the ability to say, well, I don't care what the subdivision yeah, regulations say or public works. Feel free to have your uh, fence in that utility easement. That won't be possible. Okay. Correct. I'm so sorry I mis yeah, mis misunderstood I, I your question. I probably didn't explain it correctly, but I, the, the exception to the rule is mm -hmm. what we're trying to avoid more of and try yep. to formulate the rules so that they're more commonplace with what the ask is these days mm -hmm. and also for safety factors. Yep. So I think that's that's one piece of it. Yep. Um, I did try to navigate some of the links and I think it's really good that the definitions pop up yeah. when you scan through it. And I'm glad you mentioned that when they um, need more information, it tells them exactly what else they might need. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that makes it easier for developers. Of course, all of the links are already not up and going, but I think it's a good good work that's that's up there so far. Someone, a lay person like me, can go and check it out. Yeah. So uh, as far as feedback from the community, you know, people don't really go into this unless they need something. All right. They're not just going to do it because we said, hey, do you have an hour or two to navigate this thing? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think when there's a need, they'll definitely go on and check it out and let you know. And as you put more emphasis on that focus group that uses it the most, like developers or public works folks or whomever it might be, that would be helpful. Yep. And is this consistent with what other neighborhood communities are doing as far as our changes, our modifications? Yeah, uh, definitely consistent. We've, we've pulled from a lot of other communities yeah. and, and to see how they're doing it. For example, the sidewalk topic, Pottawatomie County, especially in the Blue Valley neighborhood, all their new subdivisions are required to have sidewalks on both sides. So right. we're not uh, pressing the envelope too far on some of these standards at all. Yeah, that, that's my other concern that yep. we don't want to have uh, developers go to other areas mm -hmm. uh, because they don't have to follow as many rules as right. we, that we have or something, but make it also lucrative for them to develop here and be safe at the same time. So yeah, so far it looks good to me. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Linda Morris. Yes. We are, um, uh, there are, there's a reference here to the comprehensive land use plan. And how long ago was that? Because I've forgotten. I know it's got to be like seven, maybe eight. Uh, the comprehensive plan was last updated and uh, fully updated in 2015. 15? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's only six years. Yep. So we don't have to do it again soon. And we're, uh, the, it is aligning with what you're proposing. I did, yes, in very every much way. So. Okay, good. Yep. It's important they align. Okay. Yep. yep. In fact, all, if you recognize the the naming conventions of the zoning districts, they are uh, very similar to um, the comprehensive land use plan, land use designations, and there's a table in in two that kind of defines. Here's the new district. Here's a comprehensive plan, the land use designation. Here's the old district. So okay. we've tried to align those really well. Um, does the code inspection office use a, the, the, is their code, does it link up with what we're doing here? We've, um, yeah, they've, they've reviewed they this. they go by the building code and yep. this is the something else? Um, they have reviewed this, the, the risk reduction department has. They do, as you know, um, they're the 
ones that inspect and enforce all of our zoning complaints right. uh, and zoning violations. So yeah, they've been they've been uh, very much involved in reviewing this process. And, and two more meetings from now, you'll get really bored with policies and pro or procedures, and they're highlighted really well, or they're highlighted with the building permit process and the enforcement and those kind of things. But it's a pretty snoozer of a section. Um, so, Will, you mentioned the interlocal agreement with Riley County. Will we need to uh, just update it, or do we need to rewrite it, or what's the how big a deal is it going to be? I I think we need to update it for okay. sure. Right. Uh, one, just to reference both the county and the city's new mm -hmm. development codes, because they're working on one also. Yeah. Uh, we also have uh, the Hartford Hills area in the extreme northwest. A chunk of it uh, is outside of the Manhattan Urban Area Planning Board. So it would be best to square up that line yeah. since that is where we're developing to. Mm -hmm. And it um, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to say that development's going to be in the city, but it's not even in the planning board's jurisdiction. What kind of a timeline do you see with that? Um, we really haven't talked specifics, but I would imagine it would uh, occur near simultaneously with... Uh, so this year sometime. Yeah, I would, we need, I would like to think. Yeah, because we need to get ahead of the development. Yeah. Yeah, like, it, like there'll be more besides that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh -huh. reaching yeah. out further and further. Yeah. Did we do this with Pottawatomie County too? For we have not had that same kind of relationship with Don't have the interlocal. We have an agreement about inspection, but that's yeah. all. Yeah, we have... We have discussed it, but it hasn't gone very far. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, I do support the sidewalks on both sides um, and have all along. <laughs> For years, you probably <laughs> know that I have. Um, and um, because one of the things, we spend so much money backtracking on sidewalks. Mm -hmm. And if we had plugged them in from the beginning, they would be part of the development and it just makes sense. There are so many uh, blocks in Northview that don't have sidewalks at all. And I know the older part of town does because that was the, the plan at the time, I mean, ever since it was the town developed. But just, um, you know, we're always, people, some people are always worried about keeping costs down, but yeah. you know, there's a cost to the community when you don't have, don't insist on having something as basic as a sidewalk too. Um, the other th I, I saw uh, the uh, 26 5C11, which is the intersection site distance. And um, I see the most frequent issue I see about site distance are utility boxes that block the vision triangle. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about that for a lot of years when I was on the planning board and here. Um, and the best example I have is 11th and Bluemont when I'm northbound at the light and I'm trying and there's a big green maybe there's more than one box or two there mm -hmm. and if I were in a lower car I would have a hard time even seeing a vehicle coming sure. does this apply to utilities um, let me scan through Placement this of utility boxes too uh, I mean, I, you can I don't expect you to know everything at all at one time, so you can let, let us know, I guess. You'll be talking to us again, right? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, I'll be back a time or two. Okay. Um, yeah, let me look at that. I don't know if that um, I think that's specifically pertains to that, but uh, no, I can get an answer No, I don't know either. Yeah. I know that we don't want citizens planting bushes in the Vision Triangle, mm -hmm. and we don't want anything, but yet the utilities come along, electrical, I assume, those dark green ones, big dark green boxes, come along and, and and I don't know if the city doesn't have anything to say about where they put things, but it just seems like, as a citizen, I just see a new one and say, oops, there's one, <laughs> just popped up. Um, and then uh, the question was about drainage, and it's on uh, page 32. Um, uh, down at the bottom, it says drainage design and studies for development areas. 
the applicant will reasonably consider the impacts. And I just think that's pretty weak language. <laughs> I'm, I pay attention to water drainage mm -hmm. and flooding and reasonably consider is not going to motivate anybody to comply with er, the seriousness of uh, drainage and flood issues. So I'd encourage you to look at that. Um, we had uh, two neighbors, and I remember it probably last fall or so, and one of them fixed the drainage in their yard that caused the neighbor to flood uh, their basement and their house. Right. Is there, a, but the city had approved the, the, the drainage for the house, first house, mm -hmm. and so uh, will we be, following this for something like that yeah okay so yeah. we should not run into i mean we don't want to i don't i knowingly that's not a good word uh just uh i, I want us to not be a part of any of our citizens flooding right, <laughs> if, right. if there's anything we can do about it uh, yeah okay. the the idea behind this um the the drainage impact study yeah. Um, it outlines it here that, that they will do a drainage impact study. Um, it references um, uh, the, the broader infrastructure design and construction standards, which incorporates all those things. And it's my understanding the public works, uh, the engineering department is working on a brand new stormwater design spec that will incorporate um, what designs and studies will require. So yes, that's fairly fluffy language, reasonably considered, um, but it, this section references that new uh, set of standards and policies, and that's where the meat and potatoes will be. So it'll be only on new development, not existing development. Right, because I mean, I mean, I'm just existing is a real is, is tough to. Yeah. We try our darndest. But um, it's better to get it done when it's being built. Sure. So the, these standards will set the grades, the paths, how wide easements need to be for drainage infrastructure, um, building heights. I mean, that's the largest piece is when, to my understanding, is we spend a lot of time on the site grading and a pipe goes here to there. And then this house is way up here and the neighboring house is way down here. Well, that you're just going to flood. I mean, when downspouts get pointed and you're three feet lower or whatever, so mm -hmm. that's what the that study will will help address. Is just making sure those lots are are situated appropriately. I don't see anything in here about flooding or flood. I, just, I think I saw one reference or two, um, but that's because there's another section <laughs> on flooding and the requirements, right? Correct. for development even though it's not in the subdivision right or is it in the subdivision regulations and it's just somewhere else um it it, it largely is lives in the um, environmental standards which is the next article that we'll okay. look at so next week you'll you'll be able to look at it uh, i don't have a whole lot to discuss it unless you all would like me to go in detail i was not planning on it um uh, but we ha I have one good story to share that I'll save till next week, but okay. we have one change in it. But by and large, we haven't done a lot in our uh, floodplain regulations in Article 6, mm -hmm. but they're high standards, highest in the state, in my opinion, and um, we adopted them in 2015. So, okay. uh, And that's where all those standards of keeping lots out of floodplains, yeah. keeping infrastructure out of floodplains, those kind of things. Okay, thank you. Yep. Anything else? Okay, I don't, don't have anything that looks good okay. to me. And I think, you know, the, as mentioned, the floodplain standards we did in 2015, I, I thought they were pretty good. And like you said, they're the highest in the state. And I think I used the term, <clears throat> we were getting close to draconian, which is what I wanted to see. Because if you know, we're going to be serious about flooding, that's how it's got to be addressed. Yeah. So. Yep. And, uh, so that works, and I, and I do like the sidewalk piece. I think uh, both sides uh, works. And of course, we've had different rules throughout the years in the city, so at least that's the standard now, and we'll, we'll see what happens there. So. Yep. Yep. 
So if there's nothing else, this was the only item on the agenda tonight, so I guess uh, we can adjourn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ron, did you want to talk about um, next week and briefing session or anything? Uh, we certainly could if you if you'd like to. We've you just got, want us to email it to you, or you can just just feedback. I wasn't necessarily planning on having an open discussion about it. Okay. The 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 plan is to transition back to our regular setup, uh, beginning with our meeting next week. So okay. sounds good. Uh, we'll all be up there in full chairs. We'll have a briefing session and and the online question comments will go away because we'll be back in person. Okay. Sounds good. Thank okay. you. Okay. But and if you have uh, questions or concerns about that, uh, I'd appreciate knowing definitely. Thanks. Will the tables be further apart than they have been in the past? <laughs> Just curious. No. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> but we might not. Okay.